Hello, today's lecture is about two main elements that are crucial for the architectural design that we start to study in the basic design and many times we forget about them or at least we use them but we are not really considered them as a name. So we are talking about the elements and principles of design. This is a topic that is familiar to you, it's just to revise it and maybe take it a little bit uh, further into the context of interior design and architecture, not just based on composition. Uh, we started with a quote from the same architect that it was uh, mentioned in the first lecture that starts with the question, what is design? And the answer uh, that he found out was it's a plan for arranging elements in such a way as to best accomplish a particular purpose. So again we are focusing in the functionality and the need and the utility for a specific thing. Like we, uh, we have seen before is not an aesthetical thing, not definitely not about decoration but it's actually to fulfill a particular purpose, a particular mean and a need that we need to accomplish. So design has kind of two spectrums. So it's both a noun and at the same time it's also a verb. So it can describe the thing that it's created at the end, like the final product, but at the same time it also describes the process of creation. And how do we create design? So design is created by basic elements and those elements are the ones that you have in bullet points on your left side. The point or mark, the line, the shape, the color and the texture. And when we put together those elements, then we using different principles, we uh, acquire the design. Those principles could be unity, variety, emphasis, balance, space, size, scale or proportion, rhythm, pattern, harmony or movement. So we say that the elements of design are the pieces, the components and the building blocks of design. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do an architectural project. And if you think about it, when you look at the sketch, it's the aggregation of those elements also combined together based on the different principles that we learn that can be translated into a design. So there are different ways to see this. You can think about elements like ingredients of a recipe or parts of the machine or notes in a music, but only or even like the alphabet. So you have independent um, letters that don't really mean something particular to you, but when you put them together in a word, then they become and start to make sense. Of course, the elements of design do not exist in isolation on a building. So when you are designing, you are actually using most of the elements together and you can, are you and you are combining them into different kinds of compositions. So you are also applying different types of principles. Normally, you don't find a design that is just based on one element or just based on one principle. We have here some pictures that we can relate to a point or a mark. And of course, we can understand this just as a, let's say, a dot. But if we combine many dots together, then we can see a, a bigger and a wider picture. Those points, they can vary in size and value, regularity. They usually, they can also be used alone. And we can think about this when we do like a, an exception or we want to emphasize something. But they also can uh, be put together to create a pattern or to create a space. Of course, there is one important thing that uh, we should all understand. When we look at a point in a canvas, we actually focus in that particular point. But when we have more than one point, our eyes start to connect the points together. 
So if we have more than, than two points, we might actually uh, connect them and start to look at the line. And when we have, let's say, three points not a line, we actually can interpret them as a triangle because our mind starts to make connections. This kind of connections, they have a name that is a theory that it's uh, called the Gestalt theory. And one of the original famous phrases of the Gestalt uh, Kofta, psychologist Kofta, was that the whole is other than the sum of the parts. So when you have the individual elements, when you bring them together, you don't have the sum of those individual elements. Actually, they contribute for a different thing at the end. Line, it's made up of several points. It's an infinite number of points. And it's a form that has width and length, but no depth. The quality of the line can evoke different feelings. A curved line feels natural, organic. A straight line could feel man-made and mechanical. A del delicate line feels soft and feminine, while a bold line feels strong and masculine. Also, like horizontal lines, remind us of calmness, quietness, something that is peaceful. A vertical line makes us spire, makes us feel strong. Diagonal lines suggests movement and vitality and psychic lines are not really real lines but they implement a feeling on us so it's like looking into a specific direction like pointing to something even if it's uh, far away from the point that we are standing on and it's exactly with this type of knowledge that architects implement and bring together the elements in their projects depending on the feelings that they want the users to um, reach, then they use different principles and in, in connection to their conceptual approach. A shape, it's an area created by enclosing of the line. So we started with a point, a connection with multiple points give us a line, the line, the connection of multiple lines give us a shape. And that shape enclose the area. But this shape, it's a two-dimensional object. So it has height and width, but no depth. So we are not talking about the space. Of course, as architects, when we look up in a shape, in a plan, we kind of start to think about the three-dimensional space. But right now, we are just thinking about the elements. So we are just seeing shapes like normal circles, triangles, squares, rectangles with different types of, uh, of angles and edges. We can have the, these are the normal geometric shapes, but of course there are different shapes that we can have in architecture. We can go beyond the normal geometric shapes and reach to more like abstract or stylized shapes that many times are natural shapes that are change and to reflect the, the conceptual approach of a project. And we have here some examples of Calatrava's work and the top left side of the slides. And then we can even go beyond that and uh, see non-objective or non-representative shapes. So they are not taking inspiration of something that it's uh, real or an ab kind of a abstract relationship to what is a representation of an object, but they are actually created with, any, with no reference to anything. So they don't represent anything unless the shape itself that it's created. The other important element is the color. Color, we can only see the color because we can see when we have light. So light, it's uh, what makes the color uh, possible for us to see. So color, it's a property of light. It's an element of our visual perception and it's related to how we perceive the light in our eyes. And we will talk about, we'll have one lecture all about color. Right now, 
the main thing that you should know is that color has three properties and those are the hue, the value and the intensity or also named chroma. And with those three properties, we can create a range of different um, uh, color schemes for our interior design projects and architecture. We have here some examples of how architects use the color mainly in the facades of the building and of course the variation of the U and the saturation and the chroma the it's related also to how, how does the architect wants us to feel when we look at the project and it has to have a straight direct connection to the conceptual approach that it's behind the whole project now to finish the elements we'll talk about texture and texture is as we know like the apparent look how it feels a surface of an object and of course it's like a tactile property so it, it we have to touch something to actually appreciate the texture of it but uh, our mind again has this funny way of dealing with texture so if we already know a texture when we visually see it we can immediately understand how does it feel and architects really explore this so many times when we are talking about the materials that we are going to use in our projects this material to the user or to the client will have a specific reflection based on is uh, experience of reality so uh, many times an architect creates texture in a building by uh, certain choices of materials or by a rich layering of shapes or also by different types of forms now regarding the design principles the principles of designs are guidelines used to put the elements together to create an effective communication, meaning that they are the tools that are going to allow our design to speak and touch the users of the project. So we say that the elements are the what of a design and the principles are the how of the design. They cannot be separated from each other and they work in a dialogical uh, relationship. The first, the first principle that we are going to see is the unity. And unity, this happened many times with almost all of the principles. Sometimes we know how it looks like, so we can imagine when I say unity or unit, you can imagine in your mind how does it look like visually but sometimes it's harder to express it by words so unity means the harmony of the whole composition it means that the relationship with the elements the visual relationship works together in a kind of a same direction to provide the same images so when for some reason a project has something strange to it we say that it feels that it's not that it doesn't belong in that space it's because it's missing this sense of unity in the project unity it's a fundamental principle of design and mainly it's supported by all the other pr principles and you see this in lots of them they are they don't exist by themselves they actually support each other in this case is the same the unity could be supported by the balance by the symmetry by the contrast there are many things that can support the uh, unity and again going back to the gestalt theory that we learned that our that it's based on our visual perception the unity it's also uh, taken by this gestalt uh, view point of view as a unified whole so it means that we can see the connection between the elements as some kind of organization between them and that uh, unity could be from many things it could be by proximity by closeness so that the things are close together so we see them as a group it could also be assembled and achieved by repetition so you have the same element that it's grouped together by similarity and it can be repeated in many ways it could be line shape color value texture 
And then we have the alignment. So if the elements are arranged in a such uh, an, an alignment that it's common, we can understand it as a unity. Also the continuation. If you see a line that continues from one element to another, even if there's a break between them, our eyes will see them in perspective as a continuity thing. So this could also uh, belong to the same principle. Now, variety means to change the character of an element, to make it different. And variety, again, can be created by many different things. Variety provides a contrast with our project. So, actually, kind of means the opposite as the harmony and the unity. Uh, so they have strong contrasts when we use them in the design. We can say that without unity, uh, an image could be chaotic or unreadable, but also at the same time, we can say from the other extreme that without variety, it will be very dull and uninteresting. So actually, to achieve a good design, both in interior design and architecture, it's how the architect balances and manages this relationship between the unity and the variety of the project. Here are some examples of uh, well-known projects that are providing different types of variation of elements from line, shape, color, value or texture, so based on the elements. In the line you can range from different thicknesses, thinness, value, color, angle, length. In the shape, you can vary the size, the color, the orientation, the texture, the type. With the color, you can change the hue, the value, and the saturation. And with the value, the darkness, the lightness, the high key, the low key, and the texture could be rough, smooth. Another thing that, uh, like the, that gives us a contrast, it's the emphasis. So usually we use this principle, the emphasis, when we want to concentrate the, the eyes of the users into a specific thing in our project. So we want to focus, we want a specific element to dominate a space or the entire project. So if this is one of your goals, then this should be something very attractive that catches the eye and that stops the view of the person exactly in that specific location. Um, without emphasis, without getting the viewer to be exposed to the and look at the image, communication cannot in, in occur. That's why many times you talk, we talk about and you listen to things like the um, architectural path or engaging the user even before going inside to the building, because we are trying to explore this idea that the architect has to involve, has to gain the feelings uh, of the user to be able to develop a good project. There are here some more examples of emphasis. Like we said, there are different ways to reach it. One can be created by contrast, like we've seen in Saint Georges Pompidou in Paris. So you see that big kind of diagonal line um, that it's contrasting to the metallic structure in the background, and also the color, the redness of the bottom of the staircase that it's giving, uh, again, uh, emphasizing the element as a crucial um, thing in the main facade. In the bottom, we see the sun and New Museum in New York, and we see the emphasis also not by the contrast. We can see by contrast from, let's say, the environment, from the surrounding buildings, but if we look at just at the building, we can see that the emphasis is uh, actually achieved by the placement of the different floors and the movement of those floors from the left and the right and from the front and the back of the, of the street. One principle that uh, we all know and we always try to achieve is balance. Since the old times, balance is very important. And it's like an equilibrium 
It's like an equal distribution of weight when we look at a particular picture or, or design. And usually the balance, we kind of relate this balance to, to a symmetrical thing. But actually, we can have different types of balance. We can have the uh, balance when we have a plan or an image that is symmetrical. But we can also have balance when they are when we are looking at things that are kind of asymmetrical. So we say that it's formal when both uh, spaces are symmetrical, like here in Villa Rotonda, Palladio. But we can also have the uh, informal balance when sides are not exactly symmetrical, but the resulting image, it's still balanced. And we'll see here first some examples of symmetrical or formal balance, where you can see from, if you divide the, the picture in half, you'll have the same on your right and your left side. So it's exactly like a vertical axis is going through them. And copying, pasting, or mirror, mirroring one to the other one. But in the other hand, we have the asymmetrical or informal balance that could be achieved by different things like the position, the size, texture, or isolation. So in this case, it's more like a visual weight about different elements. In this case, like the, the top picture from Le Corbusier, United Nations headquarters in New York, you see that we have a very horizontal building down next to the river and then we have a very vertical rectangular that it's going all the way to the sky and we actually if we look at them the same thing kind of repeats in the Frank Lord Wright Guggenheim Museum we have kind of horizontal line and with the spiral um, element that it's put in there that it's giving this horizontally horizontal line sorry but then we see the vertical block on the back of the Guggenheim and also in the back of the national headquarters and we, we the United Nations headquarters and we see kind of a balance um, the way that the horizontal body is extended it balances with the same proportion that the vertical body goes directly up we have some more examples of asymmetrical things. They could even be asymmetrical with different types of uh, diagonal kind of axes in terms instead of a vertical or a horizontal one, like we see in the Oman CCTV headquarters in Beijing, China. And we can also see two more types of uh, balance. One, that it's a radial balance in the upper part, in the top part, that it's actually when you have a central point and the visual, but and the elements radiate from that central point in a kind of a equal distribution of weight. And we have the crystallographic balance, that it's kind of a repetition of a, a pattern or elements with equal size kind of everywhere, like you see here in the master plan for Paris from uh, Le Corbusier. In this case, this last one, the emphasis, it's kind of uniform because it's like a repetition of a pattern. So there is no focal point like in the radial balance where you can find a point where everything unifies. Then we have the space. And the space is in two-dimensional design is essentially flat. It has height and width, but no depth. Um, the space, you can play with the space if you manipulate the size, if you use overlapping shapes, because then you can kind of give this idea of three-dimensionality without really being using it. And then also by the location of the composition, like one shape related to another one that can appear, you know, next to our eyes or further away from our eyes, depending on how you organize it. The atmospheric perspective also, by the way that you use the value, the contrast and the colors could give different illusions of space and also the linear perspective that it's based on a visual phenomenon that, you know, all the, the pair that as parallel parallel lines recede into space and then they appear to converge at a distant point. The size, scale and proportion, it's an essential 
point for us architects to understand because this it's the bridge between the three three dimension of our projects and the users so it's actually to understand the proportion between a human being and the buildings and the spaces that we are creating so architects understand that the starting point for our perception of something is the size of our own bodies so we have different architects that explore the, our, the size of our body to reach to um, different type of, let's say, uh, like Corbusier used the modular. Before him, Leonardo da Vinci had the um, Renaissance man, that it was the most perfect man integrated in a circle and a square. So scale and proportion play a very important roles for architecture. And it's, it's important that we relate the scale of the human being always. So when we talk about proportion, it's not just the proportion between the elements together, but actually the relationship with the elements, with the contextual scale and our, us as human beings. There are different types of proportional systems. We are not going deeply into them, and I think most of you already know some of them. There is one that is the golden ratio, or the golden section, or the divine proportion. There are several names from the same thing. The golden section is a ratio that is also uh, related to uh, the Greeks and the Fibonacci series. And we can see that there are many old uh, constructions that were actually based on this type of ratio. We have here some pictures of different buildings from different cultures and they seem to kind of have uh, embedded in their construction, mainly here in the front of the facades, exactly this golden ratio or the golden section. Uh, Vitruvian man was one of the first, like Leonardo was one of the first with this Vitruvian man to talk about the dimensions and the proportions related uh, to the golden section. He based his uh, Vitruvian man with the golden section and then he also related to the architecture and to the buildings. Then later on Inspired by Leonardo's work, Corbusier started to use something that he called regulating lines. That were lines that he used to kind of regulate the principles. When he was putting the elements together, how could he, could he achieve the different uh, kind of principles? So he kind of uh, started to think about a strategy to make it easier to support his design and to make it um, kind of a modular or uh, having a spine that control it. We see here in this Ville de Roche, but also we can see it down in the elevations of Ville Savoie. And we have here some pictures of the Ville Savoie. And later on, going, extending his work from the regulating lines, he actually, and you can see how you see the inspiration from Leonardo also in his sketches, how he developed into something that he called Le Modular. And it was, the Modular was actually based on the Vitruvian man and Leonardo, this uh, relationship also with the golden uh, section. He developed a theory of proportion and dimensioning system named Modular. And he based his work in all over the modular, since the building itself, since the scale of a building to the scale of the furniture. So you can see here in the top part where you have this black picture, this actually it's related to the interior and how the man uses the different spaces with the different um, um, dimensions. And we actually see an example. Now we go for the rhythm. Rhythm is uh, an essential uh, principle 
that it's acquired by the repetition of visual movements of the elements. That could be colors, shapes, lines, values, forms, spaces, and textures. So variety is essential to keep the rhythm. Without variety, we cannot, we couldn't have like this active movement to avoid something that it's dull and to avoid monotony. So actually, when we think about, we, we think that movement and rhythm, they have to work together as a kind of a composition, a musical composition that can only be achieved when one or more elements are brought together and used repeatedly to create a feeling of a specific movement. We have here some two different shapes that are giving us this feeling. Now, another element, uh, sorry, another principle that we have, it's the pattern. And the pattern, it's a, the repetition of an object or a symbol all over a work of art. This is um, very important for the architects. Many times, not only in the facades, but also in the plans and in the spaces, we create specific patterns related to our concept to make it stronger. And then we kind of try to repeat them. Sometimes not with the same material, sometimes even not exactly with the same kind of detail. Sometimes we make it simple, sometimes we make it a little bit more complex. But we still make it as a spine and then we repeat it all over the project. And by doing that, we are not also using like the principle of a pattern to repeat an object all over the space, but also we are creating some unity between the, the, the project. We have here a pattern created for the Institut du Monde Arabe uh, from Jean Nouvel in Paris, and then we have also here El Arts in New Track Library in Holland or Netherlands. Another principle, harmony. Harmony in visual design means all parts of the visual image relate to and complement each other. So harmony, it's not the same as balance. You can say that a project is balanced and has harmony on it, but harmony can be achieved through repetition, rhythm, and all those parts can be connected together to create an area of attention or rhythm. So patterns can also and shapes can also be organized in a way that can that can create some harmony. So in the example before that I was explaining, by the use of the pattern I can create a unity within the project, but I can also um, create harmony within the different uh, parts of the, the project. Movement. Movement, we saw movement getting together with other principles to help them to support their kind of approach. Movement, it can be for us one of the important things in architecture. And movement can be kind of related to the path, the viewer's eye, how we go around the project, how we focus particular things, how we just pass by others, how we direct the lines, how we open up the perspective, how we close and make kind of dead ends, how we concentrate and make a focal point. This movement, it's normally not just by itself. It's not alone. It's always combined with different principles and it's normally also with base with different elements. Now that we learn about or review, let's say, because I'm, uh, I'm hoping that you are already um, are familiar with the elements and the principles of design, I just want to remind you that it's very important, especially now that we are starting our design phase, we need to, do, to think about our conceptual approach, to think about the organization of our plans, what do we want our users to feel in our uh, space. So think about how can the elements help you and which type of principles can be used for you to be able to achieve a specific behavior inside your project. I think this is fundamental now. Now, for to, to finish, we are. I'm just going to leave you now some slides to talk about two very important things in architecture, but 
especially in interior design, that it's human factors that are two things that are related to, to them, ergonomics and anthropometry. So the word ergonomics comes from two Greek words, and it's ergo, that means work, plus nomos, that means law. So if you bring those two uh, meanings together, it means that the ergonomics, it's a science that focuses on the study of our, let's say, human body and how we can think about the products that we are designing to decrease the fatigue and discomfort. So actually to make them comfortable for the human being to, be, to use them. So this could be in a range of different things. We can be talking about chairs for, the, for people to sit, to relax or to work. So it could be a, a sofa, it could be a table, could be a, tongue, a countertop for you to work or for you to serve in a, in a, let's say, in a bakery. So there are different uh, activities that needs to be kind of researched and explored to actually know exactly the average uh, or the, dim the normal dimensions that will require a human being uh, to make such activity successful. Now, the other one, the, the other uh, one, anthropometry, it comes from two Greek words. It's anthropos, meaning man, and then metrum, meaning measure. So it means that it's the science that measures the range of the body size in a specific population. I already explained this in the class, uh, especially to students that are, are thinking to kind of try to design their own furniture for their interior design project. It's very important that you know for whom are you designing. So population range or the average of a male let's say from the age of 30s to 40s in Bahrain, it's not the same as the dimension of a same male with the same range, but let's say in Germany. So when we are designing products, it's important to know for who we are designing. And then we need to accommodate the projects to fit let's say, the majority of them. Or even if it's not, like said, the majority, even if you are focused on doing some project that it's, let's say, a bookstore for kids or a nursery. So there are specific standards and dimensions that you need to know. And when you are going to draw your spaces, you should know the range of dimensions that you will be working on, that your users will have, so you can accomplish a good project. There are some more pictures here. I will share with you this two, uh, some books with, that are giving you the dimensions. Neufer and also New Metric Handbook. You'll receive them in PDF. And here it's, uh, it's actually to explain how this, uh, the ergonomics and the anthropometric database works. So what I was explaining about the percentage of mail from one country to another country, it's actually when you are going to, to draw or to design something. You are not going to do this for, you know, a small percentage of users. So you have to do this for the average. And this is how we kind of usually uh, base our designs. So these are the two most used architectural databases that I said before that I will share with you. Don't forget one thing that Neufer gives you the minimum dimensions. So based on the minimum dimensions, then you can calculate your own dimensions. But that doesn't mean that you should just copy paste the dimensions without thinking if they are actually suitable for the project that you are doing. Thank you.